It is important to realize that although we require additive inverses in every ring, we are not making any requirements about elements of the ring having multiplicative inverses. That is, reciprocals we don't necessarily require. Uh, but there do exist rings for which we could require multiplicative inverses. So remember, the axioms of a ring tell us that with respect to addition, we have an abelian group. It's associative, commutative, identity, inverses for addition. Um, when, with respect to multiplication, the only thing we require for a ring is that the multiplication be associative and multiplication distributes over addition from the left and from the right. Uh, that's basically it. That's all that we require when it comes to to rings. Um, we can add assumptions about commutivity. We can add assumptions about unity, um, but we don't necessarily require them in general. So let's suppose we do have a commutative ring with unity. So addition forms an abelian group. Multiplication is commutative associative with identity, and we have the distributive laws, of course. We say that in addition to that, if if a commutative ring with unity satisfies one additional axiom, this is called a field. Um, and this final axiom is going to be the multiplicative inverse axiom, for which if we take any non-zero number in the ring, so R cannot be zero, then it's guaranteed to have a multiplicative inverse, sometimes called the reciprocal of the element, such that R inverse R is equal to one, the unity of the ring, um, or you know, you get R times R inverse in that situation like so. Now we don't require, we don't allow zero to be inside of, that is we don't allow zero to be an invertible element. And when we talk about an element being invertible, we're talking about multiplicatively because every, every element of a ring has an additive inverse, okay? We don't allow zero for basically the following reason, okay? If we allowed zero to have an inverse, we'll basically pick your favorite two elements inside the ring, right? Here's gonna be a proof that that x equals y well you start off you start off with zero equals zero which is certainly a true statement then you're going to say that okay zero x is equal to zero y because uh, we've shown previously because of the distributive laws that zero is this dominant element inside of the ring for which then if you can multiply both sides by zero inverse zero inverse here you can reassociate cancel out the zero and then you would end up with x equals y. So basically what I'm saying is the only ring for which zero could be invertible would be the zero ring itself because we've just proved that every element x equals y, every element is equal to each other elements, in particular they're all equal to zero. So only the zero ring could be a ring for which zero is invertible. And that's kind of a cheap shot because the zero ring is the only ring for which zero is also the unity of the ring, which we don't allow that to be a commutative ring with unity. So it's imperative that we don't allow zero to be invertible, but if every other element of the ring is invertible, then we call this a field, okay? So in every ring, we always have a well-defined operation of addition, subtraction, and multiplication. Fields are exactly those commutative rings for which a division is possible. Uh, so let's look at some examples that we know and love very well. Uh, so the, the rings Q, R, and C with their usual multiplication and, and uh, addition define examples of infinite fields. On the other hand, the ring of integers is not a field. It is a commutative ring with unity, but the only elements that have multiplicative inverses would be plus or minus one. No other integer has an inverse, which is itself an integer. So Z is very far from being a field. Most most of the elements of this infinite set, and all for about two of them, uh, do not have multiplicative inverses. Um, what about the finite ring Zn, right? So if we take the set zero up to n minus one with modular uh, addition and modular multiplication, can we make that into a field? You know, are there inverses in that situation? Now, from the group theory perspective, we have taken a look at the elements of Zn which are multiplicatively invertible. Okay, so this would consist of what we usually call Zn star. Some people call this U Zn, or probably more commonly U of N. Uh, now, I don't particularly like this notation because this makes me think of the unitary group, but there, you know, it sometimes is used here. Uh, the reason why they use the symbol U is that we're talking about right now units, which is something we'll talk a little bit more later on, later on in this lecture 38, but not in this video. 
So Z and star, this is going to be a set of all integers which are co-prime to n, and which we've seen previously by the Euclidean algorithm, those integers which are co-prime to n will be exactly those integers which have a multiplicative inverse with respect to n, uh, multiplication by n. And that's exactly because by the Euclidean algorithm, if n and say some number a are co-prime, then we can write a linear combination. Um, you get like some a, b plus say like uh, some m, n is equal to one, in which case then we'll see that b is equal to the multiplicative inverse of a mod n. So we've seen that previously using the, uh, using the Euclidean algorithm. Now, if zn were a field, if zn is a field, then this actually suggests that every element is invertible except for zero. This would tell us that zn star must equal zn take away zero. That is, everything must be co-prime to n except for zero itself, which that would mean that every number less than n other than zero, if it's co-prime, that means none of them can be divisors of n. That forces n to be a prime number. And so this is then a very important result to mention here, that the, that the ring zn is a field if and only if n is prime. So finite fields uh, amongst finite fields, I should say, ZP is one of the most famous and simplest of all finite fields to describe because uh, that's, that's going to be these modular uh, finite fields like so. And we play around in this lecture series when we talk about algebraic coding theory, the finite field Z2 was a very important field for us uh, because that's where we did our linear algebra. Linear algebra requires that our scalars be belonging to a field. Now, I want to mention that there are other finite fields. They're a little bit uh, more interesting to construct that don't necessarily come from modular uh, arithmetic in any manner. So what I'm going to do is give you the Cayley table for the finite field of order four, right? So let's just call the elements zero, one, two, and three because we need four elements. And so in terms of addition, well, we're going to make zero be the additive identity. So we can kind of fill in what's going to go in there, right? And then if we were to talk about multiplication a little bit, Let's see if I can fit that in here. If we're going to describe the multiplication of this thing, 0, 1, 2, and 3, 0, 1, 2, and 3. Well, since 0 is the additive identity, it's going to be the 0 element. So multiplication by 0 is given, right? Uh, then we're going to let 1 be the multiplicative identity, the unity of the ring. So we're going to get 1, 2, and 3, 2, and 3. So that's information that's guaranteed when we construct this field, right? Because uh, we want it to be a ring after all. And so to fill in the rest of it, what I'm going to do is I'm going to have 1 plus 1 be 0. So basically, I want to work mod 2. 1 plus 2 is going to equal 3, um, but 1 plus 3 is going to equal 2 in this. It's going to be commutative, so we can copy that down. I want 2 plus 2 to be 0, uh, and then 2 plus 3 has to equal 1, since so it's going to form a Latin square. And then likewise, we're going to get 3 plus 2, which is going to equal 1. And then I want 3 plus 3 to equal 0. So you'll notice that along the diagonals, that every element, when you add it to itself, you get 0. It's kind of like when you add, when you, you get like mod 2, right? If you take an element plus an element, you get 0. That happens when you work mod 2. Uh, now, in terms of multiplication, you're going to get that 2 times 2 is 3. And 3 times 2 is then 1, 1. And then the last one right here would then have to be a 2. So this gives us the idea of a field of order four. In fact, this is the only field of order four. And so this is sometimes called F4 for short. Uh, now it's not usually given this label right here because again, we, we, we sometimes look at this thing right here and you look at the additive group. It is a group after all. This is none other than just the Klein four group uh, up to isomorphism. So you could relabel things a little bit. And so in terms of the Klein four group, you can think of it as like it's Z2 cross Z2. And so you have one generator which comes from the unity of the ring, and then you have this other generator just comes from something else. So what some people do when they talk about this group is sometimes instead of just calling it two, we'll call it x, for which then three, you notice, is just one plus x. So you get one plus x, one plus x, like so. And you can then redo all of this table. So you get x, x plus one, x plus one, x, x plus one, x, x, x plus one. And so in terms of in terms of addition, you see it's just the Klein four group. Uh, you see there's only four possible elements. You get zero, which means zero 
plus 0x. You get 1, which means 1 plus 0x. You get x, which means 0 plus 1x. And then you get x plus 1, which obviously is 1 plus x, like so. So we can describe, uh, you, you see there's sort of like the, you see the order pairs right here, right? You could think of 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, and then 1, 1. So we can make that identification with the Klein 4 group, all right? Well, how does the multiplication work if we're going to play that game? Let's bring up the multiplication a little bit. If we relabel this thing, we would get, you know, here an x and x plus 1. Uh, so this should look like x and x plus 1. That's not too surprising since that's the unity. That's an x. Uh, so then the, the thing that kind of gets really interesting is here, you're going to take x squared. So this is what's curious about this room is this element x squared is equal to x plus 1. And in some regard, because that's the only element it could be if this is going to be a field. So you get x plus 1 times 1. Um, you also see that if you take x times x plus 1, you get the identity. And this isn't too surprising, because after all, if you take x times x plus 1, you're going to get x squared plus x, for which x squared, like we saw earlier, is going to be x plus 1, for which in this field, um, if you ever take an element and add it to itself, you get 0, so this gives you back 1. So in fact, x and x plus 1 are inverses of each other, thus filling this out, this table. 